Hi there, Grand J here and welcome to another one of our videos. There have been a lot of Opus 5 spoilers recently and today's video we're going to do a quick recap of all the recent cards that have been revealed. Not only that, Square Enix have sent me a new card that has yet to be released and I will be revealing it at the end of this video here today. So I do hope you guys enjoy, so let's get started. So the first card here is Caius. It was revealed by my mate Jai. It is a 4 cost fire forward at 9000 power. It's got Brave. When Caius is put from the field into the break zone, discard one card from your hand. Now this card is above curve, but it does have the drawback of forcing you to discard a card from your hand uh, when this card enters the, the break zone from the field. So you do have to pay for its uh, pay for additional cost later. However, that being said, there are ways to get around this. So if you don't have any cards in your hand when he is sent to the break zone, effectively you have cheated out its cost. Next, he does have Brave, and Brave is actually a really powerful keyword uh, for forwards to have. It allows you to attack and to have these guys available on defense. So for a forward that's got a big stat power like uh, Kai's here at 9,000, having Brave is really good. He's able to attack effectively and also be able to block as well. So this card seems pretty powerful, but however, in the Fire 4 cost slot, we do have some uh, competition for him. So we have two Ruby Kantes that effectively have also similar drawbacks, um, at, but also sit at 9,000 power at the four cost mark. We have Opus 2 Rubicante, which reactivate your opponent's forwards whenever he attacks, um, but he also has the S ability Barrier Shift. And then we have the Opus 3 Rubicante, that is uh, a six cost uh, fire forward, but if you have four fire backups, then it reduces its cost to four cost as well. So in uh, compared to those other four cost 9,000 power forwards that fire has, it's a little bit difficult um, to really sort of determine um, where Caius sort of sits and how he will be sort of how he will fare compared to the other ones. He does have the benefit of him being brave and he doesn't really have too severe, uh, too severe a um, uh, drawback to his ability. The fact that he is a Final Fantasy 13 character means there is uh, some sort of synergy with him. So potentially we might see more of a sort of Ice Fire um, FF13 deck. Um, we, we have seen certain synergies that do work well between the two colors and having another uh, FF13 card really sort of adds to that. So now we do have a, quite a couple of FF13 characters in Fire. So we have Caius, we have Garot, and we have Saz. So that synergizes really well with Ice, and the, the two cards pair up really quite well. So the card that the reason uh, the thing that really just sort of holds this card back is that neither of the Kaisers have a special ability. If either of them did, then this card would see significantly more play. But as it is right now, it's a very iffy card, and I'm not sure if it will see too much play. Next, we have Garot. It is a four cost forward at 8,000 power, so it's on curve. Forwards of cost 2 you control, gain plus 2,000 power. When Gadot attacks, choose on forward against haste until the end of turn. So this is a pretty solid card. It's on curve, and it gives your forwards uh, of cost 2 plus 2,000 power, meaning that most of your 2 cost forwards are usually sitting around the 5,000 power mark, now go up to 7,000. So that's actually pretty decent. Allows your 2 costs to trade against 7 costs. Um, well, three cost 7,000 powers, so that's pretty solid. The It doesn't increase the power of one cost forwards, which is a little bit annoying. You'd figure it should sort of benefit cost two and below, but um, yeah, that's just a very niche difference. But the fact that this guy can give another one of your forwards haste whenever this guy attacks actually sets us up um, for certain synergies, especially with ice, because ice have a lot of uh, cards that do, syn uh, do synergize well when they do attack and deal damage to your opponent directly. So cards like Genesis, cards like Sarah, if you play them, um, you're able to dull and freeze one of your opponent's forwards, and then Gadot can attack, allowing you to give haste to one of your other forwards, and allows, say, Genesis to attack through as well. So there is very good synergy between Fire and Ice right now, and if we do see, like, um, if we do see a synergy between the, the two colors, I think this is definitely one of those cards that is going to see play in that sort of dual colored deck. Next card is Grenade. It is a two cost monster and it's a part of this cycle of monsters that you put into play and they have an auto ability that triggers off when your opponent fulfills their condition. So Grenade in this case is when a forward of your opponent with 8,000 power or less enters the field, put Grenade into a break zone. If you do so, it deals 8,000 damage. So 8,000 damage is a very solid number to be hitting and at two costs, it's a very cost effective way of doing it as well. But the drawback is that your opponent does effectively get to choose which of your which of their forwards um, gets grenaded so they can choose which four they play to proc off grenade so in that regard this card like is very cost effective but also puts a lot of options and choices into your opponent's side um but yeah uh there will be certain situations where your opponent will play a card that's either um going to be immune or doesn't die from lethal damage either they have some sort of uh pre preventative or defensive buff that can get around grenade or they have a card that is pretty useless that's used to for say like they play an azana maybe 
um, and that's used effectively to search for a card and grenade triggers off. So um, this is a very cost effective card, but in certain matchups it's going to be uh, very iffy. There will be times where you play this and your opponent is able to very much reduce its ability, but the fact that it's a two cost monster and your opponent, um, and it's blowing up one of your opponent's forts most of the time, generally makes it even trade out worse. And against sort of like cert uh, certain times of the game, it can be very oppressive and for force your opponent not to be able to play their uh, big cards and waste sm their smaller cards first. And the certain situations where they don't have resources to waste on smaller forwards, then Grenade can effectively lock them up from playing their bigger forwards. Next, we have Vermilion Bird Lassi Zuyu, and this is a card that I'm very, very excited for. It is a 5 cost forward at 9,000 power. When Zuyu attacks, it gains first strike until the end of turn. When a forward damage by Zuyu is put from the field into a break zone on the same turn, activate Zuyu. Um, it can attack once more this turn. Also, fire, um, Zuyu gains haste until the end of turn. So this card has free effects, and like I've said many times before, any time a card is on curve and it has free relevant effects, it is super powerful, and this card is exactly that. So first of all, it gains first strike when it attacks, so that is really, really good, and it synergizes with his other abilities quite well, because, um, yeah, if he does attack and your opponent blocks with a forward, because he's got first strike, he'll be able to first strike them out, reactivate and attack again. Your opponent can't put up multiple blockers to wear him down, because he's got first strike he, in general, he's going to be able to kill out forwards without receiving any damage, and just chain kill all your opponent's forwards. So he's very, very strong in that regard. Um, also, he's got the built-in way to give himself haste, so in sort of sort of high-pressure situations, you can play down a Zuyu, and you can just like send him in, uh, right into your opponent. So it's got a lot of really good like effects that are really sort of built into his package. But the really cool part about his middle effect is that it does trigger off of certain effects that um, deal combat damage. So for example, if you use the uh, Opus... Opus for Hecaton Care that um, that makes two forwards deal their, their battle damage to each other, or you use something like Raoban, it does trigger off Zuyu's effect. So um, in, I do foresee a lot of situations where if Zuyu attacks, um, your opponent is just not going to block because it's not worth blocking this guy because he just gets to attack again. So I do, uh, do foresee situations where you attack with this guy, your opponent doesn't block with him, and then you can use something like the two cost Earth Hecaton Care. They, he exchanges his damage with another one of your opponent's forwards, um, he, he kills it and then he reactivates, he can attack again and your opponent is again put in this situation of do they lose their entire field and, or do they just take him uh, take his damage. And so this is a really, really, really powerful pushing card and I do foresee like him being very uh, very much played in like any fire deck. He's just that good and particularly very much so in any sort of fire earth, uh, fire earth synergy deck. Next we have Glacia La Bolas. It is the Ghost Train. So it is a summon. Um, one of the new type of summons uh, that we see in Opus 5 is the ones that allow you to choose multiple options. So in this case, you get to choose two of the following options. Your opponent discards a card from hand, choose one forward, dull it, choose one forward, freeze it, or choose one dull forward, deal at 7,000 damage. So this card I like to compare sort of very similarly to the Opus uh Opus 3 2 called Shiva, and like there's a couple of reasons for that. So effectively allows, um, if you look at the bottom three, um, they're all effects that can sort of lock up effectively an attack. So choose a forward dollar that basically locks up one of your opponent's attacks. Choose one forward freeze it basically locks down um, a forward's uh, ability to attack on the following turn. Um, and choose one dollar forward deal at 7,000 damage. So if your opponent is currently attacking, you can you can kill it if it's a, a forward at 7,000 power or less. Not to mention that <clears throat> if there's any situation where you do need, need to use this ability and you don't have two forwards of your opponent to target, then you can always use uh, the first ability to make your opponent discard a card and then use the relevant secondary abilities, whether it's a dull freeze or deal 7,000 damage as well. So in that regard, it's a very, very cost-effective card because if you consider the fact that your opponent's discarding card as well, it kind of evens this card out from like a free cost or one cost because your opponent's discarding card. And effectively, you're using like really one CP to dull freeze or deal 7k damage, which is pretty solid. So um, this card on defense is very similar to Shiva in that it can deal with two forwards and it can deal with them in different options compared to what um, Opus 3 Shiva does. Um, but on, on offense, this card is much more limited because um, yes, it can dull a forward, but freezing a forward, like freezing a forward that your opponent controls um, doesn't really have much effect on your offense because that forward's usually dull already. So it's not that's not particularly great on, on offense. And the ability to deal 7,000 damage to a dull forward is also not particularly great on offense as well. So it is a more of a defensive, um, but more flexible version of the Opus 3 Shiva. And that's the way I sort of see this card. Um, the other sort of like uh, setback of this 
to the name Shiva, so it, there's no synergy between this and the Opus 4 Shiva that gets increased power for every Shiva that you have in your discard pile. But otherwise, this card is really flexible, and if it weren't for the fact that um, Ice has so many really good summons as well, um, such as like Opus 3 Shiva, Opus 4 Shiva, and Zalira, I definitely could see this card um, being played in more sort of mid-tier, more flexible, controly sort of decks. Next, we have Buckaboo. It is a two-cost monster, and again, this is one of those monsters that auto-triggers when your opponent fulfills a certain condition. In this case, when a character of your opponent enters the field, put Buckaboo into break zone. If you do, you, your opponent discards two cards from their hand. So, this card is actually one of those cards that has a lot of very mixed opinions about him. So, on one hand, it is a neutral, it's a neutral kind of like costed effect because you've spent Two, uh, you spent two CP and this card to make your opponent dis uh, discard two cards. So effectively, you spent two cards to uh, effectively discard your opponent down two cards. So, um, so in the ideal situation, it's an even trade. However, if your opponent doesn't have two cards in their hand, when they do trigger off this, you do lose out. So um, if your opponent happens to have, say, like three cards in hand and they discard two cards from their hand, to play like the four cost forward, they've got no cards in hand. So Buckaboo does trigger off, even though your opponent's got no cards in hand and your opponent discards effectively nothing. So this card is effective, uh, it's much, much more effectively towards early game where your opponent is definitely playing character cards down and your opponent is uh, does have cards in their hand. So ideally you wanna play this card on your first or second turn. Um, yeah, and that's when you'll most likely get um, the, f uh, the effect or full effect of this card. Towards the later game, like basically anywhere from like turn four onwards, I think that this card is very weak because it's very difficult to guarantee that your opponent will discard these two cards. Now, obviously this card um, works very well with any sort of ice deck that um, wants to get your opponent's hand down to zero um, because like, yeah, there's quite a couple of like ice cards that do synergize with your opponent having zero cards in hand. And so Buckaboo does really work quite well with this synergy. It forces your opponent into a, uh, into a low hand situation and then allows you to sort of um, pressure, like pressure the rest of hand very easily with the rest of your other cards. So this card um, will have its place in certain decks. I don't think it's a free off, but at the same time, um, you do want to have this early on in the game. So I do suspect that this card will probably be a two off in decks. Um, your opponent, yeah, a player will play this on their first or second turn, and generally they'll discard them if they do pick them up towards a mid to late game. <clears throat> Next, we have Une. So it is a four cost forward at 7,000 power. Une enters the field dull. Une does not activate during your active phase. When Une enters the field, choose one forward your opponent controls, dull it. As long as Une is on the field, it does not activate during its opponent's active phase. So this card is like very similar to a lot of cards in Magic, where you play a card that locks down one of your opponent's cards as long as this card lives. That being said though, Une is kind of expensive. It costs four and at 7,000 power, its body isn't particularly good. Not that you're really gonna be fighting with it that much anyways, because she does enter the field dull and she doesn't activate during your active phase as well. So um, that's pretty bad. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this card is just like super bad. Um, because yeah, Ice has plenty of ways to disable your opponent's forwards. Playing a Genesis in a lot of cases is just going to be straight up better because you get a body that can fight or defend, um, and you also are able to pressure your opponent. Whereas this card, yes, you can potentially lock down your uh, your opponent's forward um, more indefinitely with Une, but if Une does die, your opponent's forward reactivates. So there will be potential situations where you play Une, you dull one of your opponent's forwards, and then they find a way to kill Une straight away. So um, their forward reactivates during that activate phase. So Une is pretty weak. I would not play her, just play Genesis instead. This is like the poor, poor man's version of Genesis. Um, yeah, don't play this card. Next we have Herdy. So Herdy is a four cost backup, not EX burst, interestingly enough. When Herdy enters the field, you may search for one card named Montblanc and add it to your hand. Now this card is um, very interesting because it does work into this Moogle strategy and what that we have seen that in the new set, um, the FF13 uh, deck, starter deck, will have Moogle synergy. So potentially this card is a card that might see play because it's a Moogle and it searches you for another Moogle. However, that being said, Herdy is an EX burst and usually you expect a four cost backup you, um, that searches for one card to be an EX burst. So that kind of does suck. Um, and also like Mont Blanks right now aren't particularly strong. So we currently have two Mont Blanks. So we have one from Opus 2, which allows you to do more damage for every Moogle you control. Um, and also Mont Blanc from Opus 4, which searches for Marsh. Um, yeah, so this card doesn't seem particularly good because the targets that it searched 
um, aren't that many and it's very costly for it. It's a four cost and it doesn't have EX burst as well. So it's very iffy and I think definitely in ice, especially they're not short on good Moogle. So there's plenty of good Moogles in ice already. And I do suspect there to be a couple other very powerful Moogles in the new starter deck as well. So I don't think Herdy really has much of a place unless in the new set, we see some really powerful new Mont Blanc added to the game. Next, we have Gumba. So it is a two cost backup. When Gumba is put from the field into a break zone, you may search for one card named Gumba and put it onto the field dull. So backup removal is generally pretty hard to do in this game. So I do not ever suspect your opponent will use one of their backup removals to destroy Gumba. No person's ever gonna use Archer to destroy this guy, right? So that means this guy's effect is only generally gonna be relevant if you have cards that either destroy your own characters or destroy your own backup. So two or like three cards that really sort of come to mind is uh, Feral Chaos that, um, that requires you to sacrifice one of your characters when he attacks or blocks, or um, Lulu, which allows you to destroy one of your backups to deal 5,000 damage, or uh, Earth Deleter, Free Cost Deleter, that has to destroy one of your characters when he enters the field. So Gumba is a sort of yeah, easy target in those scenarios to use. Those cards have not been particularly good in the, the meta game for quite some while. Um, definitely Feral Chaos um, and Deleter Free haven't really seen play for quite a long time. Feral Chaos, nothing, not at all. Um, Lulu potentially might see a ways to use this card. So it's another just like backup that you can consume very easily with Lulu. Um, yeah, Lulu typically consumes stuff like Sage, uh, consumes stuff like Fasoya. Um, and this just gives you another backup to use uh, for Lulu. But besides from that very niche specific situation, I don't really think that this card will see any play at all. And even in the Lulu deck, I don't think he's that great. Next, we have one of the Ice Legendaries of the set, the Emperor. It is a free cost for 7,000 power swords on curve. When the Emperor enters the field, you may pay one. If you do so, your opponent discards one card from their hand. When your opponent draws a card outside of their draw phase, choose one forward your opponent controls, dull it, and freeze it. So this is a pretty powerful set of effects on a forward. So it's on curve, so that's not bad. And he does have support from the Opus 1 Dark Emperor because this Emperor can be put into play using that Emperor's effect. So if, um, you can also yeah, pay one extra when he does enter play. So if you do play this card and you happen to have yeah, one, one CP free, you can effectively make this effectively a four CP forward that also discards one, a card from your opponent's hand as well. You just paying one to discard one card from your opponent's hand is actually pretty cost effective. So in a lot of cases, I do think it's a very good trade-off to do that. So yeah, so this card is uh, like pretty good value already by itself. But its second ability is like a very, very interesting niche ability on that whenever your opponent draws a card outside their draw face, you get the dull and freeze one of their forwards. Now, interestingly enough, like this doesn't hit as many effects as you may think in the game because a lot of effects in this game are search type effects. Really the only color um, that really has a lot of draw effects is water. Um, and that's like a very good tech card to have now um, because water has had like a lot of um, a lot of cards to deal with ice in the form of stuff like Astrologian and stuff like um, and stuff like Ash. Um, now we, we potentially see ice getting effects to sort of help them counter that matchup backwards. So yeah, so whenever water draws a card, which with something like Chuchu Lane or with something like Fairy, then potentially we see Emperor being able to counter them against that as well. So um, it's a like it's a reasonably strong card in that matchup, but otherwise I don't think that it'll be particularly too good. Um, potentially it might be relevant against wind against something like moogle because it draws cards on multiple situations um, but besides from that emperor is not going to be that good and it's generally only going to be a tech card to help you out in those two matchups water and wind which do happen to be the two matchups that are most difficult for ice because they're the two two cards that have the most reactivation abilities next we have adele she is a free cost win forward at 5,000 power so she's below the curve but she has haste, so that does kind of put her about where she needs to be stat-wise. Additionally, she's got uh, an additional ability, pay one wind, Adele cannot be blocked this turn. So this card is actually a very sneaky sort of end game sort of pushing card. It's uh, very much sort of a card that can help you win condition, um, simply because, yeah, especially in like any sort of situation where the board is sort of stalemated or your opponent is like on low life and you're really coming from behind, you can just out of nowhere play this card, pay one wind, and just haste her in for one damage that your opponent has to deal with this forward straight away. So in that regard, this card is actually pretty powerful. Um, now, like what sort of archetype you might see her in will be very interesting to say. Um, potentially she might be a card that you can add as like a one off or two off in the existing Chocobo archetype, just as another way to sort of help you push through that extra six or seven, uh, six or seven damage. But potentially I could see her being played in sort of more mid range 
say, wind water decks or wind like ice decks. Um, especially when your opponent does manage to put down a big blocker like a guy or something, a Del can just help you push through it. And generally, because your opponent has like very little cards and say like a wind uh, in a wind ice matchup, a Del is generally pretty safe in a lot of cases. So I think um, she's got a lot of uh, potential to where she can end up, and this card seems pretty strong. Um, yeah, if decks have space, I do think she will see play in a lot of sort of wind X color hybrid decks. Next, we have Chocobo Knight. It is, it is free cost forward at 3000 power, so it's below the curve, but when he does enter play, you do search your deck for a job Chocobo or a card named Chocobo. So effectively, it becomes a one cost 3000 power forward. It is a standard unit as well, so you can have multiple of these guys on the field. So this card is a uh, slightly uh, slightly more expensive version of Izana because Izana is a two cost at a 5000 body that also searches for a Chocobo. But the, the benefit that uh, Chocobo Knight gains is that he is a standard unit, so he does gain benefit from Arc, which pre pretty much most Chocobo decks will be playing. Um, moving him up to 3,000, 4,000 probably doesn't matter all that much, though. Um, but his secondary ability is Dull, play one job Chocobo or Chocobo of cost four or less from your hand onto the field. And this is a really strong ability. Um, Chocobo decks are very tempo, very aggressive decks, and having this card just be able to put, uh, put out Chocobos um, for free is really, really powerful, and it does allow you to play them at instant speed, so um, if he does survive um, at the end of your opponent's turn, you can always use this ability to just put in one of your Chocobos that doesn't have haste during the end of your opponent's turn, and then your Chocobo is ready to attack on the following turn. So this is a pretty strong effect, and it doesn't specify whether they have to be a forward or backup. So at this stage, the only Chocobo backup we do know is Fat Chocobo, but in the future, if any other Chocobos that are released as backups, and potentially this Chocobo Knight can put them down into play as well. So yeah, I think that this will be a fine inclusion into Chocobo decks, and Chocobo decks are right now, like in Opus 4, sitting at that like tier 1.5, like just on the fringes of competitively good decks. So um, Chocobo Knight, and with some of the new Chocobo support, really might be able to push this into that tier one like playability um, as a deck. Um, and I'm really excited to try this card out. Next, we have the win legendary Yushtola. And this card is going to be the lock of this set. So this card is going to be the legendary that is just going to see a lot, a lot of play. Wind is going to be so prevalent next uh, next set's meta. And this card is crazy. So it's a free cost 7,000 power forward. Yushtola does not receive any damage from summons or abilities. So, by that, by that, those abilities by itself is already pretty strong. Not to mention it's also Sign of the Seventh Dawn, and we do know that there is going to be support for Sign of the Seventh Dawn in the new set. So that is another relevant factor for this card. But she has a secondary ability of put your shoulder into a break zone, choose one summon or auto ability, cancel its effect. So this card is so, so strong. This card doesn't have to dull to use the ability and doesn't have to pay any CP. As long as your shoulder is on the field, you always have the option to just straight up stop one of your opponent's auto abilities or stop one of your summons. And one of the biggest issues that wind decks deal with is because they are able to put a lot of forwards onto the field, they're always afraid of what happens if they get um, if they get Shantoda. And Yushtola is a forward that can just say, nope, you put, uh, put Shantoda down, I'll just kill my Yushtola. Cool, negate its ability. And your opponent is just so far behind in that situation. Um, and yeah, but what happens if your opponent targets at Yushtola and kills it beforehand, right? It's very difficult to do because it doesn't receive any damage from summons or abilities. So it is a card that's just super good protection. This is effectively like what Aerith brings, like what Planet Protected Aerith brings, but in a forward form. It is just a forward that's really hard to interact with. It's on curve. That's the stupid thing. It's on curve and it has such a good protective ability. This card is going to be one of the most sought after legendaries of the new set. I do recommend you guys pick it up as soon as possible. Next, we have Ingus. It is a free cost Warrior of Light forward, 7,000 power, and it's very much similar to the Refia that we saw a little while ago. So the job Warrior Light forwards and Earth forwards you control, other than Ingus gain plus 1,000 power. Dull a total of three active Earth forwards or Earth backups, choose one forward against plus 2,000 power until the end of turn. So yeah, it's very similar, <clears throat> very similar effect to what we saw on Refia. Um, it's a forward on curve, so that's pretty solid, and it does give all your warrior, other Warrior Lights and Earth forwards buffs. So this card can see play in Earth decks, um, and because Earth doesn't have too many free costs, uh, like too many good free cost wards, this card is definitely easy into the decks. Whereas Refia, a little bit more difficult because water has so many good free cost wards already. Um, and yeah, he can also be played in the multicolor Warrior of Light deck, which which is another fun deck that I'd really like to try out and see how well it goes. Um, its second ability of dulling free active Earth forwards or backups to give a guy plus two thousand power is also really strong as well, especially in Earth. Um, so first of all. 
its ability to like double your forward can be good in certain niche situations, especially against Lightning, which is one of those matchups that Earth kind of struggles with um, because um, because of Alcid um, and other abilities that can only target active forwards. So by using English's ability, you can dull your active forwards to make them sort of immune to Alcid type abilities. Um, so yeah, so that's that's one thing you could do. But also um, the ability to like dull your guys um, to give a guy plus two thousand power is just like a really good. Um, is a really good combat trick that doesn't require CP. The biggest issue with Earth though is that it always needs to keep CP open to use some of its big combat buffs. Like the monk backups, you need to keep the backups open as well as CP available to use that. And this requires no CP as well. And it only, uh, only requires free active Earth forwards or backups. So it's actually a pretty easy threshold to achieve. Not only that, a lot of Earth forwards have Brave and there's a lot of Earth support cards that give you Brave as well. So in effect, <clears throat> you can attack with your forwards and then also have them available to dull using English's ability to give them plus 2000 power as well. So this, this synergizes into the earth package really, really well. Um, and definitely this card is so far is like one of the stronger warrior of lights. Next we have Hill Gigas. It is, um, yeah, another one of those monsters that triggers from a certain trigger. When a character your opponent uses an action ability, put Hill Gigas into a break zone. If you do so, cancel its ability and break that character. Now this card may seem a little bit awkward to use, but its cost effectiveness just cannot be argued with. So first of all, it costs one CP and one card, right? Now, realistically, there's going to be virtually no situation where your opponent is playing something that's cheaper than one CP. Like, yes, there are certain very specific cards that can cost effectively zero CP, but in, more, in a large uh, majority of situations, your opponent's forwards are going to cost anywhere from three to five CP in general, right? Now, if any of them uses an action ability, this triggers off and you get to negate that ability and break that character, right? So this is actually pretty strong in itself because at the very least, Hill Gigas will always trade itself against a character. So at the very least, you've come out ahead because you've paid one for this guy and your opponent paid at least two or three more, all right? So you come out ahead on CP, right? And you get to negate one of your opponent's like action ability. So there might be certain situations where you play this and your opponent's got a really strong action ability and immediately kind of locks them out because they can't use it because they don't want to lose that powerful forward. And Hill Gigas has, yeah, effectively like two sort of like effects to him. So one, he sort of holds off your opponent's like big action abilities on the big cards. Um, and at some point when your opponent wants to deal with it, your opponent has to basically sacrifice a card. And because you put so little um, into the, the cost of this card, it's just almost always a good trade for you. So um, this card's really good. Um, obviously, there is an issue because like, if you do stack multiple of these, they all trigger on one of your opponent's action abilities. So you never really want to have more than one on the field at a time. But otherwise, this card is really, really good. I do foresee it being played in um, Mono Earth decks as a 12 very easily. Next, we have the Earth Legendary Cecil. And this card is going to be one of those very like um, love it or hate it cards. So it is a five cost 9,000 power. So it's on curve. It's got EX Burst. When Cecil enters the field, choose one forward your opponent controls. It, oh, sorry, sorry, choose one dull forward your opponent controls. If it, um, if its cost is equal or less than the damage you have received, break it. It's also got an S ability called Dark. Choose one forward, Cecil deals you one point of damage. If the cost of the forward is equal or less than the damage you've received, break it. So this is a bunch of really powerful abilities, but are also very dangerous and very difficult to use. Um, so first of all, it's EX burst ability of just killing a dull guy with um, a cost less than the damage. That means this card is going to be played towards the later part of the game. Um, but yeah, definitely if you're at three or four damage, this is an ideal st uh, situation that you're going to be playing Cecil in. Um, obviously, it's going to be very difficult for you to be playing it to kill your points like higher drops like five or six. Um, but in most of the cases, killing a three or four is generally pretty good, and it's also an EX burst. So if you do occasionally hit this on a three or on your third or fourth damage, killing one of your opponent's guys is also pretty solid. So that's already pretty good, right? But its S ability in combines and synergizes with this effect really, really well. So choose a forward, deal one, da um, deal one damage to yourself, and then kill it if its cost is less than damage you've received. So in effect, um, you can also sort of stack this on top of like his enter play ability. So when you put him into play, you can choose one forward your opponent controls, even though its cost is greater than the current number of damage you've received. But in response to that, you can then use your dark ability, kill another one of his guys, take one damage, and that might be able to put you over to kill the first guy. Um, so yeah, so there might be situations where your opponent has two fours, um, and then like 
yeah, you might be on free damage. You can play Cecil, use Dark, kill your opponent's four, and they have one, uh, and they'll come into play ability, kills another four. Um, so yeah, so it's a really strong ability, and because Cecil, there are so many Cecils in the game between Earth and Water, um, it's one of those S abilities that you can pull off very easily, and it's just an S ability. You don't, it doesn't cost you any CP, um, and it's not a dull ability, so you can like do it very easily. So it's very possible for this card to pull you back in the game. Obviously, very obviously, it's very difficult for you to use this card effectively if you're not a player that can sort of plan damage and like manage damage very effectively, um, because you might find yourself in a situation where you use its ability too liberally and you put yourself very close to dying and you just put yourself in bad situations. But Earth has a lot of cards that do synergize well with you receiving damage, um, so this card is very very solid. Um, potentially in sort of a title series as well, this card will be pretty pretty strong because it does synergize well with the free cost earth cecil that deals 5,000 damage whenever you receive damage as well not to mention um, when you do receive damage using dark's ability you do trigger off ex burst as well so there are synergies to using this card with like water's uh, ephemeral summoner to allow you to put a, a ex burst water summon on top of your deck so like if it uh, so potentially you might see yourself in a situation where you play ephemeral summoner use a play cecil use dark's ability deal yourself damage um, trigger off something like a Choo Choo Lane, a Poo Poo, or a Moogle, get yourself some cards, kill a whole bunch of your opponent's guys, and have a powerful forward on the field. So yeah, this is pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's definitely not an easy card to use, but I think at the highest level of competition, this is going to be one of those really powerful assets. Next, we have Fancred. It is a four cost forward at 8,000 power, so it's on curve. If you control a job sign of the seventh thorn other than Fancred, so that does include backups. So we have seen a, a, quite a few a sign of the seventh storm uh, backup. So Fancred is almost always going to be a 9,000 power forward in this sort of deck. Um, if Fancred receives damage while double, the damage is reduced by 2,000 instead. So um, again, that's uh, that's a very solid ability you have. It's a very sort of Warrior of Light-esque type ability. So whenever he attacks, um, yeah, he he's very difficult to kill. You, you'll need to do... <clears throat> 11,000 damage in one packet in order to kill him because he's he becomes a nine he's a 9,000 power forward and yeah he receives 2,000 less whenever um, he is like dull so this card is going to be a very powerful attacker and we have seen that one of the lightning a sign of seven storm backups do give your guys haste so I do potentially see that this deck is going to be quite an aggressive deck um, because he's lightning and the sign of seventh dawn does have lightning support he's definitely going to fit into that archetype very well um, yeah he's just an all round very solid card. Next, we have Ondor. It is a two-cost backup. Choose one category 12 forwards you control. It gains plus 1,000 power until the end of turn. Now, there are some very good targets for this. So, um, in Water itself, Ash is probably going to be the main target of this, but you can potentially do it on cards like Lazar as well. If you're playing uh, Multicolor, like if you're playing Water, Wind, Sky Pirates, then you get all the Sky Pirates from FF12 that you can buff. And also, if you do play uh, Water Fire, you can also... Um, buff up like bash as well um, and if you're really really dedicated you can also potentially play the best card in the format bergen and buff him up as well just for the lols um but yeah actually jokes aside don't play bergen he's terrible um but ondor um yeah generally he probably like outside of this archetype he won't see any play but in this archetype here, he does have quite a, a quite a decent sort of power to him. For just dull, give your guy plus 1,000 power is pretty solid. Especially in water where you can sort of combine that with stuff like with Minwoo to give you guys like that additional plus 1,000 power worth of protection. So this card is pretty solid, but it is very specific to an archetype. <clears throat> now talking about Ash, we have Vossler. It is a 5 cost forward at 8,000 power, so it is a little bit below curve, but if you control a card named Ash, the cost of playing Vossler is reduced by 2, so it becomes a free CP 8,000 power forward, which is above curve. Um, and because uh, Ash is, uh, well, if you're talking about the, the Opus 2 Ash, because Ash is a very resilient forward, um, because she gets powers up every time she um, receives, uh, every time she's targeted, she's very difficult forward to kill. Um, so yeah, she's generally pretty resilient forward. She's very difficult to get rid of. So you'll play an Ash, and she'll be able to survive for quite a while, allowing you to play Vossler on the on the following turn pretty easily, pretty consistently. Um, so yeah, Vossler's second ability: if Vossler receives damage, reduce the damage by one thousand instead. So again, that's like another great uh, another great sort of synergy. The fact that he's costing three for uh, eight thousand is also uh, is pretty solid, and having the ability to reduce damage by one thousand is like an even better effect as well. And also, if uh, if the card name Ash you control receives damage, reduce the damage by two thousand instead. If Ash wasn't already hard enough to kill, having Vossel on the field just makes her 
like basically indestructible. Your opponent has to use a ability that just straight up kills a guy. Um, yeah, because like no damage abilities are, are going to kill Ash. She's just super hard to deal with, especially with Vossel on the field. And if you have Minwoo protection, your opponent just like don't even think about it. It's never going to happen. Um, so yeah, so like we're seeing FF12, like more FF12 archetypes and synergy coming into play. Um, and yeah, potentially I, I do foresee if there's just even a couple more cards that do synergize with FF12, then we might see like an entire FF12 deck just built around Ash and just buffing the hell out of her. Next, we have Arcanus. It's a two cost standard unit at 4,000 power. Choose uh, for a dull, choose one water forward against plus 1,000 power until the end of the turn. And water, water, one dull, choose one forward, it loses 3,000 power until the end of the turn. This card is a card that kind of is just like, doesn't have a place in its color. So it is a two cost a card. So it d does mean it does have synergies with, uh, with cards like Lena, but Lena already has much, much better targets. It has Ephemeral Summon if you want to play that sort of combo style. It's got Knights if you want to have just a big body. And it's also got Fame Mimic Gogo -Go as well if you just want a big body early on. Arcanus is like a small body and its ability is very, very niche. And in general, like those abilities that you want to use on it, um, are sort of the abilities they can get with Ephemeral Summoner for free anyways. And Arcanus is a, like 4,000 power body. It's not going to survive very long in most situations. Um, so yeah, generally you're not going to play this card at all. And also like just for like another random two cost four that might seem better than this is Laza, which gives you like a Minwoo type ability and also has the ability to increase the power of your like water forwards on block by 2,000 as well. So there really just does not seem to be any reason to play Arcanus because every other card just kind of does what it wants to do um, a lot better. Next, we have the Dark Legendary of the set, Old Nark. It is a 6 cost, 10,000 power forward. If Old Nark leaves the field, return Old Nark to your hand instead. So it's, yeah, so this card actually acts very similarly to the Fire Knoll that we saw earlier um, revealed um, because um, Knoll can pay 6 to put him back from your graveyard back onto the field, and Old Nark pay six to put himself onto the field, but when he dies, puts it back to your hand. So if, in effect, though, these cards both have a very symmetric, similar effect, right? So first of all, yeah, whenever it leaves the field, return to your hand. So it's not an enter break zone ability. So even like cards like remove from ability type effects will also put them back to your hand. So any short ability that shifts them off the field, put them back to your hand. So once this guy kind of enters the field, he's guaranteed to come back to your hand at some point. So yeah, so in that regard, so that's straight up his first ability. Not too bad, but like it's like the fact that he's dark hard does make him very cumbersome, and you have to sort of build your deck to sort of be able to play around this handicap. Its second ability is kind of crazy though. Paradise for just S, take one turn after this one. At the end of that turn, you lose the game. So it's a very powerful ability. It's the first time we've seen an ability of this kind in FFTCG. Um, we have seen like similar abilities in this in like other card games. Um, this is one of those like one of those abilities that new players are just going to stay away from, um, and strong players are going to just like walk this fine line of like life and death in order to use it effectively. So this card, um, so yeah, Paradise. Yeah, it's it's a it's a crazy ability. Like I'm like I generally I generally don't like having to use it, but like in certain situations, I do potentially see this potentially being used, right? Like you don't ever have to use this, uh, use this ability by the way. Right? Um, so yeah, so in certain, like in certain archetypes where you like need one more turn, uh, obviously if you need one more turn, this is like the exact sort of ability that you want. But um, it's generally, uh, I feel it's generally a lot better in sort of more stalemated boards because in those sort of situations, um, you can push through and put your damage onto six life, but then your opponent has enough blocks to prevent you from dealing lethal, and now you've opened yourself up for your opponent to attack you, right? So in those sort of situations, um, using Paradise um, will allow you to attack through, your opponent like sacrifice a whole bunch of forwards to like survive and stay at six life, um, and then like taking one more turn will give you enough like pressure or opening to sort of push through um, to, to kill them off. So potentially that's sort of the deck that we might see it in. Also uh, uh, decks that we might potentially see it in is something like Ice. So you generally don't want your opponent to be able to respond um, or have any responses. So if your opponent's got no responses um, and got nothing to sort of defend with, Paradise is great because your opponent basically passes it back over to you. And because your opponent has no cards in hand or has dull and frozen forwards, you can just go into the head again. So um, if anything, we might see this. Yeah, I think we're probably going to see this, if anywhere, in Ice. Uh, but then again, I think it's just kind of too niche and too risky ability that to see it played that often. Um, 
thing to note though, if you do want to try testing with this card, I do recommend, um, I do recommend you only use two. You, you don't need to go up to three because this card, um, won't like this card doesn't die. So this card, when it dies, goes back to your hand. So you're always kind of going to be able to recycle it back to your hand, right? So eventually towards the like mid to late game, you're going to eventually pair these two up. And then that's when you can use the S ability. So you don't need to run free. If you want to use the S ability, having two in deck is all you need. So like, that's just a little handy tip for you guys. Um, that being said, it will be cool when you do pull it off, but, um, in a lot of cases, you generally don't want to take the risk. <clears throat> now, so we're done with all the cards that have been spoiled. Now I get to show you this new card that I've been given by Square Enix. And so for some of you guys, you might've seen that I posted a little bit of a clue. It is a knight character. So card that I'll be revealing is Kurilla. It is a four cost knight at 7,000 power. So it's a bit below the curve, but what knight isn't? So a lot of the earlier knights are all a little bit below curve. Um, yeah, last set was the first set where we saw knights that were kind of on curve uh, in terms of their power. But when Kurilla enters the field or attacks, choose one water forward you control. It gains plus 2,000 power until the end of turn. It's also got a secondary ability, Savage Blade for S, Blue, Dull. Choose one forward, deal at 7,000 damage. If you control a card named Trion, deal at 9,000 damage instead. So let's break this down. So first of all, it is below the curve, but if you're playing a water deck and you're playing a night deck, then you're going to have, um, you're going to have um, Ophelia available to you, and that's going to bump her up by plus 1,000 power, so that's pretty solid. Now, the big issue that a lot of uh, four-cost water forwards have is that they either have, like, ongoing trigger abilities, or they have enter play abilities, right? But they don't have both of them, and that's the, that's kind of the, the issue. If you play a forward such as, like, Theodore, such as, like, four-cost Tetis, they'll have abilities on the falling turns when you do trigger them off, right? But they don't have an immediate impact. Now, Kurilla is one of those forwards that has an immediate impact, so it's a card that you can come, put into play and you have an immediate impact of deal of like giving one of your guys plus 2000 power, allowing you to attack through and you've got this guy available on defense. So already he's kind of got like a value already, but then while he's on the field, he can then constantly like reapply 2000 power buffs as well. So, um, so yeah, so this card is going to be one of those cards that has tempo when you play it and also ongoing relevance as well. Now it's S ability is pretty cheap as well. So it's just S blue. And the interesting thing to note is that water actually doesn't have that many um, abilities that just straight up deal damage. Most of water's abilities all just reduce uh, forwards by a certain amount of power or increase their power. This is actually one of the very few cards that water has that just straight up deals damage. And it does not a bad, and not a bad amount of damage as well. Seven balances and damage is like pretty reasonable. It hits like pretty much kills anything that's free or lower. But if you control a card named Trion, it deals 9,000 damage instead. And that pretty much kills a large majority of forwards that you will see in combat. Now, this combined with a lot of like the water cards that reduces power, generally should be able to lethal out most uh, most forwards. Now, if you are playing this as a sort of dual color deck, um, especially if you're playing like Water Lightning, then you you do have access to certain uh, certain support cards, such as um, Drew Goltana, which allows you to search your deck for a knight, which allows you to trigger off his S ability more... Uh, uh, more regularly or more consistently, right? Now, the the condition of you requiring uh, requiring you to have a tree on is actually pretty interesting. Now, this can actually be very good or very bad depending on how tr good tree on is, right? So I did a little bit of research. Okay, so this now I'm going a little bit. I'm going rogue now, right? So this what I'm going to say next doesn't reflect any anything that Square Enix has sent me, and it doesn't confirm anything. So um, this is all just conjecture at this stage, right? But I did a little bit of research, right? And here is the Trion card from the chapter series. So it's the Final Fantasy trading card game before we have the Opus series now, right? So um, the chapters version of Kurilla was very, very similar to what we have right now, right? Um, but Trion was actually a free cost backup knight um, that powered up your knights and also could become a knight forward as well. So. That's something interesting to know. Now, I'm not sure if this is the Trion that we'll get, but this gives me a bit of an indication that we might be able to expect Trion to be a backup. And if we do see Trion as a backup, then Kurilla's S ability is significantly better because it's far better, um, it's far easier to trigger off the more the conditional 9,000 if Trion is a backup as opposed to being a forward. So um yeah so potentially i think this card is actually pretty solid and it's going to be one of those cards that you can like chuck into your knight's deck especially if you play like a mono water knight's deck um yeah being able to pump your guys up with uh, Mim, uh with waka as well as uh, ophelia is actually pretty solid um and he's just going to be able to pump you up even more and combined with stuff like um beatrix's ability to um debuff your opponent's forwards 
actually is a really, really strong combat, uh, combat um, set of tools. Also, this card is a four cost forward as well. So um, the big issue that a lot of knights have is that a lot of their costs are three or five. Um, I think, yeah, Steiner, like four cost Steiner is one of the few that are not like costed at three or five. So knight's deck, uh, knight decks are generally very weak against Zalira, the, uh, yeah, Zalira, the ice summon. Um, so yeah, so this is just like a reasonably solid four cost knight for you to be able to play. Um, that's, yeah, re that's reasonably powerful and doesn't die to Zalira. So you can attack with it pretty aggressively and you don't have to worry too much as well. So yeah, that's the card I revealed to you guys. What do you guys think? Are you guys excited or interested to try him? What do you think uh, Trion's going to do? Um, and yeah, so that's the card that I've been given. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And yeah, so thank you guys for watching. Definitely know, um, definitely let me know what you thought um, about my comments on reviews on these cards. Do you agree with me? Do you think I'm like overplaying or understating certain cards? Um, let me know. I do follow a full follow up with you guys in the comment section below. If you did enjoy this video, please thumbs up and subscribe. It just helps out with the YouTube algorithm. And otherwise, uh, thanks to guys a lot. I'll be doing a lot more content in the near future when the new set drops. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Grand J out.